So again, I wish a warm welcome to, to everyone for this um, yet another ISI seminar on, on the risk in the space environment. So um, today we will have a completely different topic. Um, I think it's really fascinating to see how much artificial intelligence has reshaped our perception of risks in the space environment, our ability to predict them. And so today we have with us uh, Enrico Camporeale, who graduated from the Queen Mary University in, um, in, in London. So he worked for some time at the Los Alamos National Laboratory at uh, the Mathematical Research Center in, in um, Computer Science in Amsterdam. And I think he, he worked on quite a lot of different topics, uh, mostly plasma physics before moving more into um, artificial intelligence. And now he's at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center and also has a position at the University of um, Colorado in Boulder. And so, as you can guess, his presentation will be about the state of the art of machine learning in um, in um, space weather. I just want to mention that next week we will have with us um, Denis Bousquet. He's someone working in space insurance or private company. He's this is somewhat different from the usual science talks we have. And I'm saying that because his recording will not be, um, his presentation will not be recorded. So if you're interested in understanding how space risks are perceived from a user point, from the uh, spacecraft um, insurer point of view, I invite you to come back next week. With that, I come back to Enrico. Um, I let you start. And just a reminder for those who are not familiar with this series, if you have a question, please write it down in the chat and we'll go through the list of the questions at the end of the presentation. So any questions you have, please keep them, write them down in the chat so that we can have um, a question answer session at the end. Thank you very much, Enrico. Uh, I'll let you start. <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks Thierry for the nice introduction. Thanks a lot for having me. It's really a pleasure to give this, this seminar. So I have way too many slides, so I, just, I guess I'll just jump in and go a bit uh, quick and try to save some time at the end to answer questions. So I, I wasn't sure how uh, well the audience is familiar with space weather, so I just put the, the standard couple of introductory slides about space weather. I won't spend too much time here. Uh, okay, so the, the, the three things we are really interested in to are uh, coronal mass ejection, solar wind, high-speed stream, and solar flares, the reason being that those are those cause some disturbance into the Earth magnetic field, and uh, the lag time between these, these events varies. Uh, so CME typically takes one, two, three, four days to arrive to Earth. Solar flares are almost uh, instantaneous. Those are X-rays, so travel with speed of light. Uh, solar wind stream depends on the velocity, but the bottom line is that those are all events that generate from the sun and after some time impact uh, the infrastructure on, on Earth. And that's why space weather is important to understand from a physical perspective, but also from a user perspective. And in fact, again, this is a sort of the, many of you have seen this slide maybe too many times, but it's the easiest way to introduce the, the effect of space weather on uh, a number of things, energetic. So there are direct damage to, uh, to spacecraft. Uh, uh, there are effects on avionics, there are effects on, on GPS scintillation. Now, you can even imagine, I mean, I recently went on the GPS, on the official GPS website, and you can't imagine how many ways that the GPS is used for uh, communication, navigation, and, and timing, uh, even in, in finance. So it's very important to, to keep the, the signal uh, working well and accurately. Uh, and then eventually there are effects on the genetically induced current, GIC, that might cause uh, blackouts on, on extended regions. So, so this is the <laughs> you know, one minute introduction of, of space weather. And in fact, uh, and this is a, a slide I've shown a, a few times, some of you have seen it already. And in fact, it, I won't go through the numbers here. It might be very well outdated. But the point here is that space weather, in my opinion, in many other people's opinion, is really a disaster waiting to happen. So something, you know, we know that uh, a current on event, uh, very strong event happened uh, in 1860 something. Uh, at that time, the only um, technological issue was the telegraph. If the same thing will happen now, 
uh, I think the, the estimate is that it will cause about 2.6 trillion in, in damage. You can just imagine about blackouts and satellites not working and so on. So the, the bottom line here really is that uh, this is a figure taken by this very funny book, the book of bunny suicides. Bottom line is that we don't want to be the bunny in this, in this figure where we just sit and wait for the a disaster to happen. We want to be able to forecast uh, these events uh, to some extent and be able to take some uh, counter uh, active measures to avoid the uh, trillion trillion dollars damage. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is waiting to happen and it does happen uh, once in a while and, and not so it's not so rare. Uh, this is an example that I just noticed uh, Today is February 9th, so this, this was just uh, happening exactly one year, uh, last year, one year from now. SpaceX lost uh, uh, about 40 satellites, and this was due uh, to basically an announcement of, of uh, atmospheric drug due to a, a mild or a minor geomagnetic storm that wasn't uh, anticipated. Uh, so this is a, a clear example of uh, uh, of a satellite and the economic loss for a, for a company. Um, and, uh, and with more and more, so these, these are LEO satellite, uh, low earth orbit satellites. And for instance, SpaceX is planning to launch uh, uh, several thousands of these uh, other companies as well. So we, we will see an increase in the numbers of uh, uh, LEO satellites and therefore an increase of, of those uh, events uh, happening. Now, the, uh, in the US, the official center to uh, provide forecast and issue alerts and warning is, the, is under NOAA, it's the Space Weather Prediction Center, which is based here in Boulder, where I am right now. Uh, you can look at the website uh, of ZWIPC. There are a large number of, uh, of products and, and forecasts uh, in, in real time, uh, and it, it's really a comprehensive view of the space weather uh, situational awareness. Now, jumping into uh, AI, uh, AI is changing, I think this is not big news for anybody, it's changing the landscape. And by that, I mean, I mean every landscape. And just for fun, I, this is a Google, the result of a Google search. If you Google AI is changing the landscape, you can see, again, how many landscape AI is, uh, is uh, impacting. And I don't even know. So there are like SEO, which I believe stands for search uh, uh, engine optimization, clinical decision support system, accounting, business, of course, uh, uh, marketing, uh, GIS, uh, which is something like um, geographical information system, uh, entertainment. And the point I'm, I'm trying to make here, I guess, is that um, aside from all these, uh, everyday activity, AI is really changing the way we do science. And that's, that's I guess, what is most uh, relevant for, for the audience here. And it's changing the landscape for writers. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes uh, on a, maybe a funny side or a funny note. What I was uh, um, preparing this presentation a couple of days back, I decided to try play with ChatGPT. I guess everybody is now familiar with this very popular uh, natural language processing or, or chatbot if, if you want. I was thinking maybe ChatGPT Chat can help me uh, design uh, uh, a better uh, presentation. So I asked, uh, uh, write a comment on the future of AI in space weather forecasting models. And this is what, what it says. Uh, well, maybe I'm not gonna read, read it all, but basically it says the AI has the potential to improve space weather, uh, can al analyze vast amounts of data, identify patterns. Uh, uh, this can lead to more accurate predictions. Uh, of space weather, and interestingly, it, it pointed out some specific predictions for a flare, dramatic storms, uh, uh, power grids. And what is very interesting is the last sentence says, however, it's important to note that AI in space weather forecasting is still an emerging field, and more research and development is needed to fully realize its potential. So when I saw this, I thought, well, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is really <laughs> right on spots. Then I realized, well, yeah, sure, this is this is all well, but it's also very vague, and maybe that's the reason why I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's a very vague statement. It's it's hard to disagree with, with such a statement. Then, uh, uh, and please bear with me, another couple of slides. I kept playing with this. I said, well, can you mention some more 
specific example of AI where AI has proven successful in space weather. And I was particularly interested in see where he has possibly outperformed uh, physics-based models. And then, okay, this is again a, a long answer. I say, yes, uh, AI has already shown promise. Uh, and interestingly enough, without me pointing at any specific uh, thing, um, it, uh, it, it listed these three, these three uh, applications of so prediction, geometric storm forecasting, atmospheric modeling, and says these are just a few examples. But then again, if you read carefully, this is just very, very vague. It's just, uh, and that's possibly how chat GPT works. You know, this has learned from a vast amount of, of, of literature and text and that's just you not know, picked up the right, the right words. So I was I was trying to poke it once more and say, okay, as a scientist, no, this is this is not good enough. Now give me some references. And this is where things got really sketchy because it says it mentioned four references. And you know, I've been working in the field for a while. I mean, all of us, of course, once in a while miss some references, but I I was not aware of any of those references. I said, well. And I've been I've been working on solar wind prediction, and you know, this seems really relevant. I so, said, well, I, I don't know this reference. What's what's going on here? Then I saw, okay, may, maybe let's let's try to point it to something I'm familiar with. So I ha happen to have um, authored a review paper, which is fairly uh, uh, has a fairly good number of citation. Now it was published in 2019. It was a review paper on machine learning for space weather, and so I said, you know. Is there any good review paper on <laughs> that topic? And yet again, I said, yes, there are these three review papers. And I was, wow, uh, I, I've missed those review papers as well. I mean, I, I'm not familiar with any. And the interesting thing about ChatGPT is that you can refresh, you can regenerate the same another answer for the same question. So I said, well, let's let's keep going. Maybe you know, at some point I was kind of trying to boost my ego, see, you know, does it find my own uh, reference? And this is on the right is, is yet another reference is fine. And this is published in, in JGR Space Physics, which is a journal I, I keep track on. And, and then again, so I, I didn't see this reference. So then I have this doubt uh, and I actually looked on Google Scholar, I didn't find these references. So I asked, now, did you just make this reference up? Are you, are you sure it actually exists? And this is what makes it really interesting and, and, and get to the point right now. So it says, I apologize if the reference is incorrect, as a language model, I don't have the capability to verify the existence of every scientific paper I mentioned. So I was like, wow. So this means that the, the chat GPT really made up those references, which are very plausible. I mean, again, if you look at the title, the journal, the name, it might be a, a real reference. So this is, I guess, is a, it's kind of a long story to, to get to the, the first take home message of this talk. AI needs to be trustworthy. And this is the proof that at least for now, I'm sure that ChatGPT will, will improve in time. It's kind of a beta version, if, if you wish. But right now, it's not trustworthy, right? I mean, you can't trust a, a, a chatbot that just makes references up, at least not for, for scientific purposes. Then I thought, okay, maybe there's a big caveat here is that, and, and this is the fact that maybe I didn't utilize the, the AI model in the way it's intended to utilize. I shouldn't ask for... Um, for references, if uh, if that's not the purpose, and uh, as this, this last slide again, bear with me about uh, ChatGPT. Then I'm on more interesting stuff. So okay, but do you know what is the most highly cited review paper? And again, I was trying to see if, if it somehow find my references, uh, my reference, and and then here it's it was honest. Say, well, I'm not aware of the most highly cited review paper. And then again, maybe this is a a sign that this is was a bad question for ChatGPT because it, it's only trained on, on historical data. It cannot, it doesn't have uh, live uh, information. So it cannot possibly tell you what is the most highly cited paper at any given point. And then I finally said, okay, <laughs> I kind of put it out there. Have you read the review paper by, by myself? Are you even, you know, do you know that there is a paper that I wrote? <laughs> is it yes, I'm aware of a review paper, Benico Campore Allen. Now I had a bit of, again, uh, 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 confidence boost when it says, Rico Camporelli is a well-known re researcher in the field of space weather. So I said, okay, you, you got it right here. It's published several papers on the topic, but then really the cherry on the, on the cake is that it says the paper you're referring to is likely, and again, it 
it spells out a, a reference that doesn't exist. I never wrote this paper. This doesn't exist. Never wrote in, in living review. So it's it's plausible, but uh, but the, it's it's fake. And then again, this is, I guess it's a, the second uh, take on message that AI needs to know what it doesn't know. And it's very important when we're going to use it for forecasting, like space weather forecasting. It needs to have the ability to say, look, this is all, you know, this is where my knowledge comes to a, to, to a limit and I'm not able to make this prediction or, or this prediction, in other words, you know, comes with the uncertainty quantification and the uncertainty is so large that the prediction is, is useless. And it looks like, again, ChatGPT doesn't really know what, what it doesn't know. And this is actually the, the real page I was pointing to. I'm just going to cite and do some uh, self-advertising because mostly of my remaining part of the talk is actually based on, on this review paper that was published in, uh, in 2019. The actual reference is, is space weather, not living uh, review. All right. Now, before jumping on, on the actual topic of AI, I'd like to make uh, yet, so this was the first preamble, I'd like to make yet another preamble. Because I think it's important to understand from the, to do a bit of history of space weather and understand how did we get here? How did we get where we are in space weather prediction? And the point, this might be a bit controversial and, and I realize that, but the point I will try to make is that there has been a narrative all these years, you know, since the, the birth of space weather, essentially, about an analogy between space weather and, and meteorology on ter terrestrial space prediction. And it's really interesting to look in a retrospective now in what, what we know now at papers published you know, 15 or 20 years ago. And, and this one that I, I put up here is a very interesting and very well written paper by uh, the late George Cisco. I believe he passed away last year. He was one of the no, fathers of space weather and, and I believe um, magnetospheric physics in particular. This is a chapter uh, published in this uh, monograph, uh, again, published in, 20, uh, in, in 2007. And in this paper, Cisco lists 10 stages of the history of progress in, in, in meteorology. And again, makes an analogy with, uh, um, uh, with space weather. And without going too much into details, I really recommend reading this paper. It says that the effectiveness of meteorological forecasting increased with the advent of numerical forecasting, what he calls stage nine. Then it says the advent of physics-based numerical space weather prediction, the stage of dramatic improvement in forecasting effectiveness, again, this stage nine, is still in the future for space weather. Although codes to achieve such prediction are under development. And this was, again, 15, 16 years ago. So there was this expectation that, that numerical codes or physics-based prediction will catch up at the level of, and will be as successful as, uh, as numerical weather prediction. And in fact, if you look at meteorology, and this is a, a more recent paper published in Nature in 2015, that talks about the quiet revolution of numerical weather prediction. And what it says basically uh, is that numerical weather prediction essentially is one of the greatest achievements in the history of science. And however, advances in uh, NWP, numerical weather prediction, have been a quiet revolution because they have resulted from a steady accumulation of, of knowledge and advances over many years that have not been associated with fundamental, uh, fundamental physics breakthrough. And I, I just want to highlight these three. So it's, it's again, a very interesting review paper that I, I suggest to, to read. Uh, you know, it's not space weather, it's numerical weather prediction, but the, the three, uh, fundamental ingredients uh, that this re review paper highlights are the following. Physical process representation, ensemble forecasting, and model initialization. And this is another way of, of, of saying data simulation, basically. And, and in fact, if you look at the, at the advances in, in, in numerical prediction or the forecast skill, it's really amazing. And we are now all familiar with the fact that a one-day prediction is uh, uh, on average is, is accurate 98% of the time in numerical uh, weather prediction. And this has been steadily improving by, you know, since the 80, uh, and what is shown here is the, the three day, five days, seven days, seven days prediction, in the North and South hemisphere. Um, so the, the bottom line, what I'm trying to get here is that for the last 20 years, the accepted narrative in the space weather community has been that space weather is a younger sibling of terrestrial weather. 
And as such, there has always been a hope that space weather will soon achieve the same level of extraordinary success witnessed in, in numerical weather prediction. And as a consequence of this, of this uh, narrative, the majority of effort and therefore the majority of funding has been spent over the last 20 years in developing physics-based models. Now, I believe that it is now time after no, 20 years of developing models or maybe more, it is time for revisiting the narrative and to actually admit that physics-based models have not delivered what it was expected about 20 years ago and probably will never do. I mean, this, this is, I mean, nobody really knows. It's, I'm not saying it's not keep working, uh, it's not worth keep working on physics-based model. But again, if you look at these three elements, these three crucial ingredients in numerical weather prediction, the fundamental reason is that you know, the Sun-Earth system will probably, in my opinion, never reach the required level of accuracy. So again, if you wish, the analogy with meteorology is nothing but, but a myth because physical processes representation, like subgrid sub uh, uh, representation in numerical weather prediction, it's just too hard for us because the separation of scales between kinetic and fluid physics in space weather is just enormous, first point. Staple component, no, no matter what the prediction works because it does ensemble modeling. And we just have a lack of in situ observation of space weather drivers. We just have uh, the remote observation of the sun, essentially. But possibly the, 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 the most crucial point is that the, the reason why NWP works is that because, because of data simulation. So any given run of numerical weather prediction assimilates on the order of 10 million observations. You know, observation all around the globe about uh, wind speed, temperature, uh, humidity, and whatnot, all, all atmospheric quantities. And we will never achieve this level of observation to assimilate in, in our models. So I'm just gonna conclude this maybe a bit too long preamble, looking at the state of the art operational physics based models. I don't, I don't mean to pick on any of those particular models, but just want to state what is, what is a factual uh, uh, thing here. And um, so here, the, there are these three models on the, on the left. WSA is the, these are all operational models as WIPSI. WSA NLIL is the model that predicts solar wind uh, speed and, and CME propagation time. SWMF or the geospace model does uh, geospace prediction like uh, geometric indices and regional uh, magnetic disturbances. Uh, YMIP is uh, ionospheric, uh, thermospheric models. So the three, the point I'm trying to get here is that the, the three, at the bare minimum, any forecast needs to have this three characteristic. It needs to have a long enough lead time. And if we look at the lead time of WSA and it's, it's very good actually, it's one to three days ahead. Uh, WMIP does two days ahead prediction. SWMF is not that great because it just relies on the propagation time between L1, where we have in situ observation, and the bow shock, which typically is between 20 and 60 minutes ahead. The second very crucial characteristic of uh, any forecast, not only space weather, is that it needs to be actionable. So this is a combination about having a long enough lead time and having a quantified uncertainty on top of your prediction so that the user can take uh, a real action based on that uncertainty. And nowadays, and of course there are, there are plans for to improve this, but as of today, none of these models has any uncertainty quantification. And then finally, maybe the trickiest point to characterize is the accuracy. And, and the, the simplest way to look at accuracy is that you want a model to be, to the very least, uh, as accurate or better than a zero cost model, such as a persistence model or a ballistic model. And uh, yeah, okay, this is tricky because it, it might need more than just a, a plot uh, or just a table to quantify the, the accuracy of, of a method. Of a method, but I think it's fair to say that uh, WSA NLIL is no better than zero-cost models such as drug-based models. Uh, SWMF is no better than the persistence model when it, for instance, comes to the prediction of geometric indices. Where might be, to be honest, I put a yellow box here because I'm not aware of any validation about it. So I just do not know how, how well it, it does. And I think I think has, has been published on, on that aspect. Now there's a, another uh, aspect which hasn't really to do with accuracy or lead time, which is just the cost. I mean, it's something that oftentimes we physicists or scientists 
overlook that, but every computational model, uh, everything really in life has a cost. And here, what I try to estimate is the CPU hours per year. Uh, so WSA Enel is actually fairly uh, cheap. It's, it's only 50,000 CPU hours. Uh, Geospace is a order of magnitude more expensive. It runs about, I mean, at least the way it runs right now, it's about 400,000 CPU hours per year. And WebMIP is about 300,000 CPU hours. Now I also put a, a dollar cost because CPU as a cost associated with that, this is very ballpark. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really even trust my estimate. I just use some um, Amazon WSA cost, which which vary quite a lot depending on your machine, on the RAM, on the you know the number of processor. But these are the I think the correct ballpark. So we're talking about a few thousand up to fifteen thousand dollars a year. This is just to run the model, not even thinking about storage RAM and so on. So I've been talking like, like 20 minutes about physics maze model, and I was prom promising to talk about AI. And this is my, my take on message number three. Now, the point is that given the actual situation where we are, namely the physics-based model are not really promising nor uh, accurate enough, I think our only hope uh, uh, for space weather prediction is that machine learning will become the standard way of space weather forecasting. And my own prediction, seeing the, you know, the surge, the, the, the increase in number of publication and applications, is that this will actually happen by the end of the decade. And this is the same table for machine learning. Now, for machine learning means many things, you know, depending on what application you use for, but Typically, depending on, on what you use it for, you can have a lead time that goes from one hour to three days, which is not uh, related to the physical processes you are looking at. Good thing about, about machine learning is that it, it is so fast to, to run that you can very easily run ensembles, or in some cases, there are some machine learning methods which have a built-in uncertainty quantification. And then again, the accuracy really depends on the application, but I, I think it would be it's fair to say at this point the most machine learning um, application we have seen in, in the literature are typically better than their physics-based equivalent. And then the interesting thing, I mean, it's not, it's not crucial, I believe. I mean, we, we will be happy to, to pay a high cost for models that work. And this is what we do with numerical weather prediction where you know, these models are extremely expensive. But the interesting thing is that I just make an example here of a model called LiveDST, which I will mention shortly. It's a forecast uh, uh, of uh, DST, geometric index, uh, made every 15 minutes. Uh, all in all, this is only 250 CPU hours per year. And the cost of this runs on uh, AWS. Uh, the cost is less than $10 per year. And this is not only CPU time. This includes everything like uh, storage, I.O. time, RAM, and, and so on. So it's really you know, several orders of magnitude cheaper than, than physics-based models. So, in the next five to 10 minutes, uh, uh, I'm going to jump now of what actually can machine learning do for space weather. I guess that's the thing most uh, people in the audience were interested in. This is a very vast topic. So I'm just going to go through uh, a number of applications. It's a non comprehensive list. I apologize if you not. Know, I'm going to cite a few papers, uh, and those may not be the most representative. Of course, the, the, the change is, is um, the field is changing so quickly. Now, the first thing that possibly the, the most successful and also easiest to do is geomagnetic indices. This is something I've been working on for a number of years now. These are two papers I've, I've co-authored. This is an example of a DST index for a, a strong, uh, uh, one of the Halloween storms in, in 2003, or Halloween events, storms, where the observed DST went down to minus 400. It's a, the yellow line. This model published in this paper, which we call GPNN, it's a combination of Gaussian process and, and uh, uh, neural networks, uh, uh, is the, the blue line, which is not perfect. I mean, we will never get any model perfectly, but uh, it's it's good enough, I would say. And more interestingly, if uh, if you compare that with the, the Zwipsy geospace, uh, uh, you can see that it, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't do bad at all. The the, the geospace model. It just doesn't do as good as, as the neural network. And then more recently, we looked at, uh, so that was a, a few hours I had prediction. Uh, we're looking at the one day I had prediction of geomagnetic uh, of DST storm using uh, so images. And what is shown here, and this is the paper, 
What is shown is the in red is the probability that DST will exceed uh, a threshold of minus 100 nanotesla, and the blue line is the actual. Uh, this is again the Halloween. It's a, another Halloween storm uh, on the actual Halloween day. Um, and so the blue line is, is the observation, and you can see that the probability that this was issued like one day ahead. So this is the probability that one day ahead you say, okay, DST is going to exceed this threshold, and you can see that this. Uh, increases dramatically and it actually peaks uh, at the very time when when the the DST uh, uh, storm peaks and, and reaches a, a level of minus three three fifty. So DST prediction is very very successful. Uh, yet another work done by university uh, people from the University of Michigan is uh, explainable. So CMH is the high frequency version of, of DST. This is a one hour ahead and two hours ahead prediction. Um, which are very good, but I think what is very interesting about this paper is that they use explainable, explainable methods. And what it means is that at any given time, what they can do is to, you know, taking these uh, several inputs, you know, the IMF, um, uh, the BX, BY, BZ, the speed, density, temperature, and so on, they can say how much of this uh, quantity contributes to the final value of CMH. And you can see how this varies in time. So this really is uh, understanding the physics be behind the, the, the geomagnetic storm. Then there are a large other number of, of applications. As I was saying, I'm just going to go quickly sort of flick through this because I want to conclude with um, sort of a roadmap for, for AI in, in space weather. Uh, so this has also been very successful, the idea of, of uh, what is called segmentation of coronal holes. Uh, in solar disk images. So you, this can be done either in a supervised or unsupervised way. And the idea is to ex automatically extract different solar regions. And we know that different solar regions are associated with different uh, geoeffectiveness of the wind. Typically, coronal holes uh, generate uh, uh, fast wind. Uh, so this is a way to you know, take this kind of image and automatically uh, differentiate between different, different uh, regions. Again, in, in AI, this is called the segmentation problem. One of the possibly the, the most active research area in, in machine learning for space weather is trying to predict uh, solar flare. This is kind of the holy grail right now, one of the holy grails. Uh, what I'm showing here, there are so many papers, but what I'm showing here is a, a model which has been made operational by the kind of the, the Japanese counterpart of the Space Weather Prediction Center. And in fact, you can go on the website and, and get a real time prediction of uh, basically it tells you what is the probability that each uh, active region will flare, I, I believe, within the next 24 hours. This is, uh, again, a collection of uh, many, a short uh, uh, sample of, of many, many papers on, on uh, uh, solar flare predictions. Solar wind classification. So as I said, the, the geoeffectiveness of solar wind is related to its source region. There was this paper by Shu and Borowski in, in 2015 that they introduced four category of solar wind, uh, so, so kind of four types of solar wind. And what we've done here is to classify, to use a, a method called Gaussian process, to classify the solar wind, uh, again, using machine learning. And then once you, you train on, on labeled data, the <laughs> data that was um, labeled by a human expert, we have classified about 40 years of Omni, <coughs> Omni data. Now, <clears throat> there's an ongoing effort within SWIPSI to see if these models can actually be run operationally on the next, uh, either on Discover or the next uh, SW, um, SWIFO L L1 satellites. The same, the same thing, the same problem you can uh, approach with unsupervised classification, where you let, uh, uh, and these are a couple, few, three papers here, where you sort of try to find patterns and cluster in the data without deciding a priori how many kind of uh, uh, how many kinds of clusters there are. So this is called unsupervised classification. So visualizing and interpreting unsupervised Robin classification, data-driven classification of coronal holes, and, and so on. Another maybe second uh, holy grail is to predict solar wind speed. Basically, solar wind speed determines very much all the dynamics of the inner um, magnetosphere. There are uh, a few papers. I just mentioned three here. Uh, one of the most successful, I think, is this one by Edward Brown, where they train a fairly complex neural network based on uh, 
UV, UV images from SDR. This is just one example of the prediction versus the, so the blue line is the, the observation and the red is the prediction. And of course, there's still some improvement to be done, particularly, you know, it oftentimes it misses the, the peak, but the overall uh, trend is, is, is pretty good. You also know so this is a model that tries to predict the ambient solar wind. So every time there's a CME, it actually will miss the, the, the quick transit of the shock of, of the CME. This other paper here is a different approach. So this, this one is where you have a fixed time lag of, of three days ahead. This paper here by Mandar Chandorkar, um, who was a PhD student uh, in, in Amsterdam, tries to make it more general, where the where you are also try to learn what is the um, what is the time lag uh, between a given image and the solar wind observed at other one. Then there are a number of papers, and this is I have to say this is the the area where I'm least expert on uh, ionospheric scintillation and thermosphere. But at least for what I've seen from, from publication is that GNSS uh, uh, ionospheric scintillation, uh, you can get a pretty pretty good accuracy using, using machine learning forecasting those uh, scintillations. Uh, and then there is a uh, work on trying to, uh, to understand and improve neutral density prediction in the, in the thermosphere. And then finally, some work I've been involved with is uh, uh, radiation belt electron fluxes. Uh, there are a number of a large number of papers, mostly two large groups, uh, uh, one led by Jacob Bornick and the other led by Yuri Spritz. I've been working on uh, developing different algorithms to uh, forecast either the uh, the plasma sphere uh, uh, electron density or directly the fluxes of uh, electron at different energies in the, in the radiation belt. Uh, something related to this is a recent paper I, I authored. And this is interesting uh, because uh, we use this uh, very innovative technique called the uh, uh, physics informed neural network. And what we do here is actually to try to do a data-driven discovery of the physics law with machine learning. So this, is, this was focused on uh, uh, radial transport of electrons in the radiation belt, so a, a 1D diffusion equation, if you wish. And what the machine learning does is to find, to kind of solve the inverse problem and to find the optimal uh, coefficient, the diffusion coefficient. And on top of that, what, we, what we've uh, shown in this paper is that if you generalize that equation into a drift diffusion equation, that will give you an even higher accuracy for, for forecasting. And therefore, you kind of discover with machine learning the, the, the appropriate or the optimal diffusion and drift coefficient in this Fokker-Planck equation. And I believe that the physics informed neural networks or, or PIN are really going to be uh, more and more used in, in our field. OK, so I'm going to conclude with just mentioning at least three uh, model, machine learning models, which are actually operational right now. So I already mentioned this, uh, this one uh, that does sort of fair prediction. This is the, the website. Uh, the ESA Space Weather Portal actually uses a, machine, a neural network to do uh, KP prediction, uh, one or two or three hours, four hours ahead, it says here. Uh, and then my, my group has recently made public on this website, uh, uh, this live DST prediction I was talking about that may, basically makes a, a, a probabilistic. So you can see here, there's, there's an error bar, probabilistic prediction of DST from one to six hours ahead. This is based on a fairly uh, new and convolved uh, neural network architecture. Okay, in the, I believe I have, uh, another five or, or 10 minutes, uh, I just wanted to kind of jump on a well, related but different topic. Uh, uh, again, this is uh, adapted by uh, from, from this review paper I, I published a few years ago. And I just wanted to uh, draw what, what, in my opinion, is the path forward for machine learning in space weather, and in particular, highlighting what I believe are six uh, specific problems that the community has to overcome or to solve in order to make machine learning really successful for space weather predictions. So the first problem is what I call the information problem. And this is uh, characterized and uh, simplified by this, by this figure here. Um, so the problem is what is the minimal physical information required to make a forecast? 
again, this, in this example, if you think about it, if you want to make a forecast, say, of solar wind speed or, uh, or any solar wind quantity at, at L1, where we have just one scalar observation from a satellite, um, the assumption is that this, uh, this information is somewhat, somehow hidden in, in those solar images, uh, either magnetograms or uh, UV images. So we, at any given time, we have about 200 million pixels from these images. So it's a really ch big challenge how to extract this information. So there's an overflow of information, if you like, how to extract this information from these images in order to make a prediction of just one number, uh, maybe three days later. And the assumption I think is strong because it's basically, again, going back to physics-based model, is the same assumption that physics-based model uh, use. So if we assume that that is valid, that there's no reason to assume that that would not be valid in, in machine learning. So in other words, I, I strongly believe that this information is contained in these images. The problem is how to extract that. A second problem is the gray box problem. So I don't want to give the impression that I want to completely throw away you know, these 20 plus years of, of research on, on uh, physics-based model. And for once, I'm, I'm certainly, I mean, I come from a computational physics, uh, uh, computational plasma physics background. And uh, I, I, I do believe that all these physics-based model have been very successful and very useful in, in understanding the physics of, of many processes. Uh, different issues to make prediction, and that's where they sh they fall uh, short, I think. Um, so the gray box. So there might be a way to combine the information we get from a physics-based model and the information we get from a machine learning. This is exactly what we did in this paper published a couple of years back, uh, which we call the the gray box uh, approach. So what is the best way to make an optimal use of both the physical understanding and the large amount of data? And what is shown here, okay, in, th in this particular case, we were focusing on, on the BDT, uh, and this was cast as a classification problem. So it was, what, what is the probability that the BDT exceeds a given threshold in a given uh, uh, time? And what is shown here, the, the yellow, blue, and red lines are the prediction made with the, so white box would be just the physics based or the geospace model. Um, the black box is just using machine learning, completely data-driven, and the gray box is the combination of the two. And you can see that basically the gray box is, is, is the best of, uh, combines the best of, of uh, both worlds. Now, the third problem, the surrogate problem. So now you, you might be familiar with the fact that uh, this is a uh, figure taken by this uh, review paper. This is actually an actual re review paper, not made up by ChatGPT. Space weather is very complex in the sense that there is, there is a chain of different processes and different models that are, that are put together. So it might be the case that we can just uh, simplify one of these uh, uh, components of the, of the big space weather chain and, and replace it with in machine or in AI is called as a, a surrogate model. So the question is what components in this, in this uh, complex chain can be replaced by the approximated uh, black box surrogate? And when you do that, how much are we willing to accept as a, as a trade-off between loss of accuracy and speed up? Because again, you, you've seen that running machine learning models is uh, hundreds of thousands of times faster than running a physics-based model. Uh, I believe I've, I've lost count. I believe this is problem number four, uh, the uncertainty problem. Um, and this comes to the, to the issue of uh, uh, forecast being actionable. So most space weather prediction comes in terms of single point predictions. You say DST is going to be minus 200. It's just one single point. And there is, you know, if you want to make these predictions actionable, there's a clear need to understand and assess the uncertainty and to understand how this uncertainty propagates from, you now you do a prediction of solar wind speed, it comes with a certain uncertainty, how that propagates into the prediction of uh, uh, GIC and, and so on. And these are just two, two papers that actually go into that direction taking a deterministic model and building uncertainties on, on top of that in a, what we call an accurate and reliable way. Okay, problem number five. Uh, uh, this is a very severe problem, the too often too quiet problem. Uh, space weather data sets are typically imbalanced. We have many days of quiet conditions, which are not very interesting for us. Then only a few hours of storm. So very rare and extreme events. And this poses a, a problem for any machine learning algorithm. 
There's also an associated problem of how to even define meaningful metrics that actually assess uh, the ability to model and predict interesting but rare events. So this is a paper that actually is a statistical study of, of the probability of uh, occurrence of extreme events. And this one on the right is a, uh, this is not even a paper, uh, but it's just a, a post represented at the last AGU. We'll come up with a way of, of generating synthetic uh, solar wind. And one of the reasons is to augment the data set uh, uh, that we can use to train machine learning models. So to make these extreme or rare events, well, still extreme, but less, less rare. So that the, the training set can be more representative of, of reality. And the last problem is the knowledge discovery and explainability. And this has, has to do with space weather, but maybe more with, with space physics. And at the end of the day, as physicists, we want to distill some knowledge from a machine learning model. And again, at the end of the day, improve our understanding of a given system. So a, a trend which is very strong now in the ML community is the one of explainable and interpretable AI. So how do we open the black box and reverse engineer a machine learning algorithm? And this is a, an example. Uh, this was just the, the archive preprint of that paper I already mentioned, where we uh, discover missing physical processes in radiation belt modeling using machine learning. So using a completely data-driven approach. Okay, I hope... Uh, I've been more or less on time. So this is the, the summary. I now realize I forgot to put down my email address, uh, but it's it's fairly easy to find on, on the web. Uh, and I'm always very happy to, to chat with anybody that is interested in uh, any of those topics. And I would just leave this summary up. But I really believe that machine learning for space weather is, uh, well, first of all, is the quintessential interdisciplinary field. It requires knowledge from, from space weather and from machine learning. Those are six problems that we need to solve uh, real quick uh, because they not only hinder progress in space weather, but they're actually fundamental challenges in the fields of, in the broader fields of, of AI. And then again, my very uh, own prediction is that um, machine learning will be the dominant way of doing um, prediction in space weather by 2030. Thank you very much for, for your time and your attention. Wow, thank you so much, Enrico. This was an excellent talk. I'm I'm speechless and actually I'm very disappointed because I immediately looked up the Living Reviews website to find your review paper before you told us that it was not there. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I was not the only one. So um, we have quite a few questions here um, um, using the Omni2 data dataset. Do you have a Python application with your research? And, and do you have any links to the example data inputs and outputs other than the GitHub used in your research projects? Yeah, th thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's really hard to, to keep updating these websites. So oftentimes they're, they're outdated. So that particular project about the Omni2, um, yeah, it was, it was done in MATLAB. And uh, I think there is right now, actually, there is work ongoing within Zwipsy to, as I was mentioning, to see if that model can be useful for uh, for real time forecast, uh, mm -hmm. and the person in charge of that, uh, I think, I mean, one of the plans is to actually uh, translate that to Python. I, I have to admit, I, I'm still a big MATLAB fan, so oftentimes I, I do things in MATLAB. But other projects like the DST, the Live DST, which actually I've been at give credit to Andong Hu, which is the a postdoc working here at CU, just done most of the coding. Um, he does everything in Python, and um, so on his GitHub page, I think there there are many uh, different repositories for for all of our projects. Now, the for that particular DST, live DST, I don't think that the code is is uh, available public right now. But there is the intention to make that public at some point, and um, you know we're just kind of testing the code right now. And also, more importantly, I think to make public available the, the output of, of the DST model. I mean, right now you can just look at plots and download images, but you don't have access to the to the model output, which is all st stored in um, Amazon AWS. So it's very easy on the cloud. So it's very easy to actually download. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next there's a question by uh, Renato Filler. Um, again, I'll, I'll let you speak up. Renato, if you can 
you're allowed to to speak if you if you want if you can unmute your microphone okay if, if not uh let me read his question so um he, I would appreciate your thoughts on methodology. Do you believe general statistical versus machine learning methods and algorithms will be sufficient and suitable for space weather prediction? Or dedicated space weather oriented machine learning ones should be developed for the purpose? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And yeah, yeah the short answer is, is no. I don't, I don't know. In my experience, and I've tried this in a, on a few projects, um, I mean, this is kind of a, the double edged sword of, of machine learning. It's, it's so easy to take an algorithm off the shelf. You know, there are so many libraries. You know, if you do that and, and try to apply, unless it's a very easy problem, but you know, our problems in space weather are not easy. So if you try to apply those, they typically just don't work out of, out of the box. So you really need, and that's where the domain knowledge comes in hand. You really need to tailor uh, the the model to, to the problem you want to study, and mm -hmm. most and that's the the avenue I'm I'm more interested in right now. You know, I mentioned this physics inform neural network. Possibly, you need to inject into the model as much physics as as you as you can. So this combination of of machine learning and physics. Uh, uh, informed or physics guided uh, network, I think it would be very successful. Uh, mm -hmm. And one example I've seen in, for instance, in atmospheric sciences, you know, you can have a neural network where you have some cons physical constraint, like you no know, energy conservation of uh, the fact that a given invariant is, is positive defined. And these things can actually help your, your machine learning. And I think that's, that's the way we're going to mm -hmm. uh, completely, you know, data driven out of the box, uh, typically. <laughs> not mm -hmm. work. Okay, so we actually we have several questions along the same line. First of all, just to comment to you, Yana Maneva, um, your question about SpaceX has been answered a few weeks ago on January 19th in a talk given by Ilko Dornbos on the Seta Drag. So there you can find all the information you're asking for. Um, so Angelos has another question, uh, Angelos Vuridas on um, uh, models again. So Angelos, are you ready to talk? Yes. Yes, uh, well, Hope you can hear me. Yes. Yep. Uh, yes. No, it was more of a comment and an agreement with uh, Enrico, Enrico uh, relative to the physical versus numerical models. But um, this also something where we differentiate between our physics and, and space weather, which I think a lot of people have mixed up. Um, and so it kind of prevents us from developing proper policies. Physics models have a, a a home in physics and astrophysics for sure and we need a lot more um, understanding of how things mm -hmm. happen between sun and earth, and earth relations but Enrico is is uh, right for space weather we need something actionable and this will probably come from numerical models now the good thing and that goes to Renato's comment earlier, uh, earlier is that what the bad thing is that we're missing data so we're mm -hmm. not going to make any progress yeah. in any of these Things without more data, since we sparse the, sim the system so widely, so the data will help both physics and numerical uh, models. But we have to use it right, and so I think we should put some emphasis on getting the right data at the right places, with the right format that we can drive both the ML uh, effort and the physics effort. Mm. Yeah, if you can just add, yeah, I completely agree with what you just said. And once again, let me emphasize, I didn't want to give the impression that I, I want to throw away all the physics-based model. And as I said, I mean, my, my career really started as a computational plasma physics. I've been doing particle in cell simulation, other kind of simulation for half of my <laughs> scientific careers. And that's essential to, to, to get a better understanding of the, of the physics processes that then in turn will, you know, um, Will uh, uh, inform our our models for space weather predictions, but but you are right. I mean, the, the data is really fundamental. Again, I was talking about this myth of the analogy with meteorology, but uh, if there's something we can learn there is that you know they advance so much because they have so, so much data, and maybe we will never get to the point of you know, how many data they they have. Like you know, it's unforeseeable that we are, will be able to ingest 10 million data points uh, in in real time in space weather, but we do need more, more data nevertheless. Mm. Okay. 
Um, so there's a question by Michael Contreras, but I see he's left. So I move on to um, uh, Jorge Amaya. Um, Jorge, if you can. Uh, speak up. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Well, not very loud. <laughs> okay, let me get close to the microphone. So, uh, thank you, Enrico, for the presentation. I, I fully agree with many of your points. Uh, I, I maybe disagree a little bit on the, on the thinking on, on saying that uh, physics-based models might not have a big future as AI. I think both might have uh, equal opportunities to help. Uh, my point is, uh, my question would be, uh, for both AI and uh, data simulation, we required a lot of data to, to improve the models. So how do you see the difference? Why do you feel like AI might have a better shot than data simulation with physics-based models? Uh, to the, get better predictions in, in, in space weather. Yeah, okay. Hi, Jorge, good, good to hear from you. Um, so if I understand your question right, um, so you, you're kind of saying that there's still the, the chance and the, the possibility that um, physical-based model aided by data simulation will still deliver good predictions. Uh, the, the point I was trying to make is that that's exactly what happened in numerical weather prediction, but yet again, they have the advantage of having uh, so much data they can assimilate. So, so numerical weather prediction will not work if they do not nudge their prediction every, I don't know, every hour or so, or every six hours towards reality using, using uh, real-time data. Um, now I wouldn't know. You now what would be the the analogy with space weather? I mean, right now we have, uh, aside from in from remote observation of the sun, which comes with the, their own issue, we have basically one data point at L one for in situ observation, and then we have data points uh, on Earth like ground magnetometers and so on. The main difference is that you now the numerical weather prediction assimilates data, which are, which are, I believe, are the the, the main physical quantity that go directly into the Navier-Stokes equation, right? They assimilate uh, density and, and temperature and pressure, and, and those are the main uh, physical uh, variables of the, of the Navier-Stokes. We can assimilate, if you think about uh, ground magnetometers, sort of derived quantities that are not used. So it's, it's very hard to think of you now all the chain, how you use ground magnetometers, which are not the millions anyway, <laughs> a few hundreds maybe uh, data points to do the whole chain from the sun. So I, I don't really see the, the analogy. Uh, I mean, everything is worth pursuing, but I think we have to be realistic at, at some point. I'm, I'm not sure if, if I address your, your question properly. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. And uh, I was just wondering if uh, that data is also important for AI. So it's more or less the same case. If if we don't have the data structure, the, the magnetic field structure of the solar corona, how are we going to predict with AI? No matter how advanced the AI, how are yeah. we going to get the prediction? Something I'm trying to work on it, it. The way I see it, it all boils down to a to an inverse problem. So we have we have plenty of solar images in uh, remote observations. What we don't have is the is the correct information to drive models, right? So that boils to a, again an inverse problem because we only you know we can tweak models based on you know, things about solar wind uh, propagation or CME arrival times. We had this one point at L one, and we need to 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 solve the inverse problem and to see you now what is the optimal boundary condition that gives me this this one this uh, uh, correct uh, prediction at L one. So it's hard, but and, and I do agree. I mean, this was said earlier already. I mean, I do agree that the more data, the the better, but um, yeah, I, th I think we need to utilize the data we have in, in the most optimal way. And I think that's where really machine learning can, can help. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I see we have two questions by uh, Marchand. So I don't know your first name. So Marchand, you have two questions if you want to ask him. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, the first question was about the scarcity of data. So that's, this has been uh, addressed in the previous question and maybe questions plural. But the other one, uh, you mentioned that uh, with uh, physics-based models, and I don't want to be the advocate of, of physics-based models, uh, that uh, you, you have one point and you, you, you don't have the uncertainties, but... Uh, in at least for uh, in meteorology, I know that they they use ensemble uh, modeling. Uh, isn't that the same uh, also in, in space? Uh, weather physics based models, uh, you can do ensemble modeling and you can get uh, uncertainties this way. Yeah, th thanks for the question. So uh, yeah, I think it's the same. And uh, the point I was trying to make, uh, and and there are plans actually even within Swipsy, for instance, to run ensembles of of Enlil. Uh, in my opinion, that will not solve the problem because ensemble modeling is, is tricky. So, the, and again, again, we might be kind of misled by the success of, of uh, numerical weather prediction. Yes, they do run ensemble, and that's the way they uh, quantify their uncertainties. Their ensemble generation is all driven by data simulation. So, it's all uh, probabilistic uh, changes of, of boundary of boundary or initial condition, which are you not know, using Bayes theorem, basically are you know, there's a certain likelihood that this uh, initial condition is uh, is close to reality and so on. Um, it's very hard to do that, and, and again, it's all based on on in situ data. So you you know you no know, you 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 observe what is the temperature at this point, and then you can run an ensemble around that. In our case. We will need to change boundary again. Thinking of the example of solar wind propagation, we need to change boundary condition on the sun, where we just have <laughs> remote observation. So what might be the happening is that we generate ensemble. So okay, let, let me, <laughs> I'm kind of rambling here. Let me say this another way: the the output you get from an ensemble and the and the uncertainty you derive from that is all completely determined by how you generate the ensemble, right? It's a nonlinear process that goes in a nonlinear uh, solver, but dynamics that goes from, from your initial condition to the output, but that's completely deterministic. So the way you generate your ensemble members completely determines your output. And if you don't do that uh, appropriately, and to do that appropriately, you will need in situ data or, or some strong data simulation, the ensemble model will just give you some some spread of your prediction, which are not really representative of the real uncertainty. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So next comes uh, Manolis. Manolis, can you speak up? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Enrico. That was very interesting. Uh, here's a question that I had. We have seen often in, in different machine learning applications, different methods that are supervised. So you can do your parameter ranking and then try to make sense of what you are observing. But parameter ranking tend to give you different results for different methods. So this is something that you cannot obviously rely your physics on because you cannot depend physics on the machine learning method you're using. Uh, can you comment on this? Uh, have you experienced this or uh, what is your overall feeling about that? Yeah, no, I'm an artist. Thank, thanks for the question. You're absolutely right. Pa parameter ranking is, a, and there are you know, a large number of papers about that, is, is a tricky business because you, you're, um, you're perfectly right. It very much depend, or at least slightly, it might depend on, on the method you use. And I've, I've experienced that myself on this pin work I did, there is a, um, so I did, I wanted to do feature extraction or ranking. And I've seen that doing you know, backward elimination or forward, uh, it actually gives you different results. Um, so that that is an, an issue. So that result all, also has to be kind of taken, um, well, not only with a bit of a grain of salt, but also in a kind of probabilistic uh, sense. Having said that, uh, you know, many papers I've seen, uh, you know, the, the ranking may be different depending on the uh, on the particular model you use. But if you take you know, the first five or first ten features, uh, they're pretty much always the same. There's there's very strong agreement. Uh, again, you know, the one might come first in one method and second in the other, but but overall, it's it's robust in deciding. It's robust in deciding at least which features are not important. I think I will put it this way. 
Yes, you are right. I mean, in terms of the non-important features, you get a better pattern than in terms of important, uh, at least in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, the order of the importance of these things. But uh, like you say, I totally agree. You have to take all these with a grain of salt. And uh, uh, in some cases, I mean, this is not this is not a panacea. In some cases, you do see very different ranking from uh, very different methods. So yeah, no, I mean, indeed. But again, if if you think of this in in the in with the perspective of uses using that ranking, maybe to to use uh, uh to use those features as a, as the input of a neural network, uh, you know, the neural network, uh, even though that doesn't always work, but the, the idea is that. If you input a feature which is not relevant, the neural network should be able to disregard that information, right? So it's always maybe safer to put one extra input which you're not certain about, than uh, than you know choosing only the one that you, that are very high ranking, mm. although it might come with an extra cost. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I missed an earlier question by Andy Smith, who left in the meantime, but I think it's it's a quite general question that is often pops up, uh, which is about extreme events. How do we ensure that machine learning models extrapolate to unseen, that is extreme parameter space in a physical manner? <laughs> Well-known question. It's a typical question I, I had many times. So couple of couple of comments. Okay, okay. It, it is well known machine learning cannot cannot extrapolate mm. that's that's for sure so you can only learn whatever it's in in the training set uh now there is <laughs> there's a yet another myth uh, I, I want to kind of debunk there is this, the idea that physics based model will do better in extreme event that's not given at all and in fact you know without going too much into detail we, we do know that some of the models we run as wipsy will even you know to, just fail or crash for very strong events for a number of numerical reasons mostly. So there are a number of things, you know, numerical reasons, and, and also you know, physics-based models have a number of physics assumption, you know, mostly very simplified assumption that allow them to run in real time. It is not given that will hold for extreme events. Um, so that's one comment. Another, it's um there is a, I think, a too much uh, oftentimes too much emphasis on extreme events. Those are not one that worries me too much. I mean, even if a machine you know, a neural network is not able to predict a, a DST of minus 500 because there's no such thing in, in our recorded history, um, it's not a big deal because if we will ever get a DST of minus 500, that means that there will be a, such a strong CME that the forecaster will notice that you know, in, in, in time and will be able to give a appropriate forecast. So in other words, it's much easier to forecast extreme events than mid-range events. And I'm not advocating for a human forecaster to go out of the room. I mean, we still need those for sure. So uh, let me take the last two questions because it's getting late or we're running out of time. There are lots of questions, comments, and uh, suggestions in, in the chat. So I invite you to read these as well as many links. So there's a question by Veronica Haberle. Um, Veronica, can you speak up? Turn on your mic. Uh, Veronica, can you turn on your microphone? Otherwise, She's asking you to read the question. Gary. Yes, okay. Ah, okay. So um, there's a vast knowledge of the physical processes and model to play important roles in space weather. Wouldn't it be a good chance to leverage this knowledge for machine learning applications? I'm thinking here about physics informed neural networks, as you mentioned. How did you see PINs perform better than other machine learning approaches? Uh, you're talking about making forecasting using pins. Well, her question was really about performance, performance of pins compared to standard machine learning. Yeah. Yes, she yes. answered yes. Yes. Yep. So yeah, pin is a bit of a different league. They're typically used for for two purposes. One is to solve partial differential equations, so kind of a surrogate uh, in lieu of more standard numerical methods. And the other way is, which I think is the more interesting and more powerful, is to solve 
inverse problems, that, like the way I, I mentioned in, in, in that paper about radiation belts. Um, in principle, I mean, it's, it's a bit tricky to use pins for forecasting because the, uh, it's a bit of a different uh, paradigm than, than, than supervised machine learning. So you solve this equation with the pin, the, the partial differential equation within your training set, and you will not be able to generalize the, the solution for future time. Having said that, there is a, a more recent development of, of pins called deep on net, which are so pins learn to solve partial differential equations. Deep on net learn a, a neural network representation of, of nonlinear operators. Mm -hmm. So that might actually be more useful, I think, in the future to use for uh, for actual forecasting. Okay. Okay, thank you. And then we have the last question by uh, Dario Del Moro. Dario, if you can turn on your mic. Yes, uh, coming. I ask you to unmute. I don't know if I... Uh, please talk very loudly or very close to your computer. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, hi, Enrico. Thank you for the, for the talk. Very nice. So uh, my question was about using surrogate data mm. to to help uh, for our information lack. So the lack of data to train our mod methods on. So I know of, uh, at least a couple of groups that are trying with either uh, GAN or diffusion model to generate data and then trying on those other machine learning methods. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I, I, I got it. Thanks for your question. I, I do have an opinion. Uh, and as I said, I, I, I recently um, presented at the last AGU this new method that we've been working on, my group has been working on, <clears throat> to generate synthetic sort of wind data. And the idea is exactly that one, that once we, you know, right now we have generated like a, a million uh, synthetic sort of wind data, uh, which I don't know, hourly cadence, I don't know how many, it's maybe 100 or 150 years of, of data. Uh, train on storm time. So this data tends to reproduce fake storms. Mm -hmm. And now the next step, uh, and this is the open question, is whether training models with that data will be, will be any, any good. Um, I think uh, it's, um, it's almost imperative to, to, to generate that uh, augmented data to, again, to uh, alleviate the problem of uh, uh, imbalanced data set. Now, I think it's easier. So that's what we did with sort of wind data, which is basically a time series. And it's fairly easy to do that. Uh, it's much harder to use guns and more sophisticated stuff uh, mm. to, for instance, generate synthetic solar images. And people have, have done that. At, uh, there are some results I know about from the GFZ group. Because uh, then the question there is how to, uh, how to validate, right? I mean, you can have a pretty solar image uh, how how physical how real that is, uh, but it's something. I, nevertheless, I think it's it's worth uh, keep working on because again, the the real issue is this the imbalance of the data set. That we need to come up with with ways of uh, mitigating that issue. Mm. Okay, thanks. So with this, I think it's time to stop. <laughs> Uh, there will be quite a few more questions. Again, um, Enrico, thank you very much. This was a very, very inspiring talk. And I invite everyone, if you want to listen again to this talk, it will be available from tomorrow onwards on, on the EC website. Um, just a last announcement. Next week, we have someone from a space insurance company who really bring an inside story showing how uh, space risks are perceived from the company insurance company point of view. So that's something completely different. And after that, there'll be one more talk by Sandra Chapman and there will be a break. And after that, we start with a, a monthly cycle of um, EC webinars. So thank you again for being so for so many of you coming today and um, have a good day and hopefully see you again at EC or attending any, any of our webinars. And again, Enrico, this was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.